Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2018 Shaw Prize Lecture in Life Science and Medicine at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I'm Arik Ng, an MC today and also a year four student. Today we are honored to have Professor Mary Claire King, the 2018 Shaw Laureate in Science, in Life Science and Medicine to speak with us. The Shaw Prize is an international award established under the auspices of the late Sir Run Run Shaw to honor individuals who have advanced distinguished and significant scientific advances in research. It consists of three annual prizes, astronomy, life sciences and medicine, and mathematical sciences. Each prize carries a monetary award of 1.2 million US dollars. May I first invite Professor Nancy Yip, the Vice President of, uh, for Research and Graduate Studies of HKUST, to speak a few words of welcome. Professor Yip, please. I'd like to extend my uh, warmest welcome to all of you at today's uh, Shaw Lecture to be given by Professor Mary Claire King, the American Cancer Society Professor of Medicine and Genome Sciences at the University of Washington, and the 2018 Shaw Laureate in Life Science and Medicine. The Shaw Prize is one of the most uh, prestigious prizes for a researcher. Winning it is a testimony of the recipient's immense achievements. Professor King was awarded the prize in recognition of her discovery of the first breast cancer gene, BRCA1. Using mathematical modeling, she predicted and then demonstrated that breast cancer can be caused by a single gene. She successfully mapped the gene to human chromosome 17, which she then also cloned. Her outstanding work revolutionized clinical approaches for screening and managing cancer risk for, thousands, for millions of women uh, worldwide. The technique she pioneered has since been applied to studying the genetic basis of many other complex diseases. Professor King is also known for a number of other significant accomplishments. During her doctoral work, she demonstrated that humans and chimpanzees are 99% genetically identical. More recently, her research has advanced understanding of the genetic basis of ovarian cancer, schizophrenia, and genetic disorders in children, as well as shed light on human evolution. She also pioneered the use of DNA sequencing for human rights investigations. Additionally, she has been very supportive of women and minority groups in science. As further testament to her immense scientific accomplishments, Professor King is elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the French Academy of Sciences. She is also the recipient of Laska Special Achievement Award for Medical Research in 2014 and the United States National Medal of Science in 2016. Professor King's talk today is entitled Genetics as a Way of Thinking and Genomics as a Set of Tools. She will discuss how modern approaches from gene genomics offer the possibility of finding rare disease-causing mutations and how exploiting the information can help develop prevention and treatment strategies with illustrations from the genomic analysis of breast and ovarian cancers. Before I hand the floor over to Professor King, I would like to thank the Shaw Prize for bringing the Shaw Lectures to the university every year. These lectures provide the university community golden opportunities to meet great minds and be enlightened firsthand. 
And this is especially the case for the young audience I see in front of me. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Mary Claire King. Thank you, Professor Yip. So begin with, before we begin our lecture, we would like you to present a souvenir to Professor King as a small token of our appreciation. The souvenir is a miniature replica of the carved mural located at our sundial podium. And the mural depicts 39 ancient Chinese achievements in science and technology. Thank you. Professor King will now deliver her lecture. I'm going to try to tell you a joke. And it's sometimes difficult to tell jokes that, that translate across cultures. So we'll see if you like this joke. See. <laughs> this is a true, a true story. And I'm telling you this story because, um, because Dr. Ip mentioned that, the, uh, that some of my work when I, was, when I was a student was about the close relationship of humans and chimpanzees. So here is the story. When my daughter was just finishing high school and just before she began university, she wanted to go with me to visit Ireland because part of our family ancestry is Irish. So that was fine. And this was a long time ago. This was probably how long? 22, 23 years ago. And in those days, the roads in Ireland were still quite narrow. And, the, and also, people, there were no cars that were automatic transmissions. All the cars were manual transmission. So we arrived in Ireland, and I rented a car. But I hadn't driven a manual transmission car in years. And, and I was also driving on the other side of the street, from the same side of the street you drive on here, but different than we do in the States. So I was focused on the road and not driving the car into a ditch, and you know all the things you have to think about when you're doing something that is not natural. So I was driving along, just watching the road. And suddenly, Emily said, Mommy, stop. I stopped. And she said, look. And there was a small billboard, a small advertising sign beside the road, dark green sign. And in golden letters, it said, scientists have shown humans and chimpanzees are 99% the same. <laughs> and then at the bottom it said, drink Guinness. <laughs> and Emily looked at me and said, Mommy, that's you. <laughs> that is the nicest thing she ever said to me. So please, the next time you see your mom and dad, say something really nice to them, even if it does not have to do with Guinness. <laughs> So that's my story about the chimpanzees. <laughs> what I'm going to do today, and let me see, I'm going to do this better if I have a pointer. And this kind person loaned me a pointer when I was practicing. There we go. And now I have it again. Perfect. <laughs> what I'm going to do today is use our work on understanding inherited breast and ovarian cancer to illustrate my principal theme, which is that genetics is a beautiful way of thinking, philosophically and aesthetically, and that now that we have very modern tools, we can apply this thinking, this way of thinking, to really difficult problems with the expectation that we will solve them. So I'll give an example from my work, but I hope that you will be thinking about examples from your own studies that you might want to undertake when you begin your research careers. So we're going to begin this story 
with one of my favorite people. This is Paul Broca, for whom Broca's brain is named. You know the portion of the brain called Broca's brain? This is the same guy. And he was a surgeon in France in the 19th century. And in addition to his work in neurobiology, he understood a great deal about cancer. One of his, one of his books is called Traité de Tumeur, and in that, in that treatise, he describes families in which cancers of various sorts, in this example, breast cancer, occurs in multiple generations. So all that I have done is to translate the French paragraphs into a modern pedigree format, as you see here. So just to review very quickly for people who haven't taken genetics in a while, recall that the way pedigrees are constructed is that this is a married couple. Circles are females, squares are males. A line through a symbol means that the person has died. Um, a filled symbol means that the person has whatever the condition is we're going to concern ourselves with. So in this case, it's going to be breast and related cancers. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. A partially filled circle means they have another form of cancer that is probably not part of our story. And then a vertical line means that these people here are the children of those people there. So exactly as was explained in, in the preceding video. And as you can see in this family, Dr. Broca has, has records of breast cancer occurring in four successive generations. His own studies were in pathology, and he was working with autopsy material from patients who had died of breast cancer in the family. And he was very, he was very good at pathology, and of course he found the breast cancers with no difficulty. It's been easy to diagnose for thousands of years. But he also found cancers in the liver or in the abdomen. For example, here, here, there's a couple of more. And he writes in this cote, I wonder, he says, if these cancers, although they are in the liver, are not of the liver. I wonder, he writes, if these cancers might have invaded the liver from the ovary. So gold star for Broca. He probably was describing some of the first families with inherited breast and ovarian cancer. I like to imagine what it might have been like if Broca, working in the 1860s in, in Paris, and Mendel, working at the same time in Brno, and Darwin, working at the same time in southern England, had had, what's up? <laughs> it might have saved us the next 130 years of slogging through genetics if they had been able to communicate with each other. We know, in fact, that both Broca and Mendel were admirers of Darwin's work. Broca was a member of a society of free thinkers who read Darwin and discussed it. And very recently, in, in, the, in the small house that had been Mendel's home in Brno, someone came across a copy of Origin of Species with Mendel's notes in German along the side. So we know that both of them knew of Darwin, but of course no one knew of Mendel's work. And insofar as we know, Broca and Darwin never actually communicated with each other. But if they had had access to the same technologies that we do, I'm sure they would have. But they didn't. So we, much less brilliant people, spent a lot of time trying to solve these problems. So the work that I'm going to describe is the story of the consequences of the successful identification and ultimately isolation and, and sequencing of the BRCA1 gene. And I'm not going to go through the history of how that was done, primarily because none of you will ever need to do genomics in this way. And you are very fortunate that you don't need to. You will never need to positionally clone anything in mammalian genetics. If you work in plants, you might need to because we don't have genomes of all the plant species, but you'll probably just create the whole genome rather than positionally clone anything. If you want to learn what it was like to be a positionally cloned gene, you might like to read a very short memoir that I wrote in 2014 in Science <laughs> on the 20th anniversary of the cloning of BRCA1. Science asked me to write 
a memoir as if I were the gene. Pretend you are the gene, what it was like to be cloned. So I wrote a little story about the race to clone BRCA1, and I recommend that, that little story to you. And this is the principal figure from that little story. <clears throat> but what we're going to do today is skip right to the, to the story of how we integrate the information about the sequence of BRCA1 into an understanding of inherited breast and ovarian cancer. <laughs> so I'm going to start intentionally. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Good. With, with a couple of the same pedigrees that were shown in that video, but of course now I'll explain them in, in more sophisticated detail to you all. Uh, this is our family number one, and it shares some features with the family that, that, that Dr. Broca described in that breast cancer appears in multiple generations, but it has additional complexities as well. For example, in this family, as you see, the, that we know what the mutation is that's responsible for the inherited predisposition to breast cancer is a deletion of two base pairs right in the middle of the BRCA1 sequence. And a deletion of two base pairs is, of course, a frame shift, right? So a frame shift means that the reading frame of the gene has now changed so that a stop a stop codon will occur quite quickly, and indeed, in this particular case, occurs immediately. So that means that translation of the, of the gene into protein is, is abrogated, is destroyed, and in this case also there is nonsense-mediated decay, so there's not even a transcript left on the mutant, on the mutant allele. So we know, because we've sequenced the, the BRCA1 for each person in the family, we know who carries this mutation and who does not. So notice several things. First, as you would expect, breast cancer can be inherited, or the mutation leading to breast cancer can be inherited from mothers. But notice also that it can be inherited from fathers. That's hardly remarkable. BRCA1 is on chromosome 17. It's an autosome. Men have autosomes also. Men have BRCA1 sequences also. It's just that it's very rare, it's not unheard of, but it's very rare for a man to develop breast cancer in consequence of having a BRCA1 mutation. I will later on show, show a counterexample. But by and large, men who carry mutations in BRCA1 or the sister genes have no health consequences, but of course they can pass on those mutations to their daughters or their sons. Next, please notice that it's not only breast cancer that's involved. Here's a person who developed breast and ovarian cancer. Also notice that it's possible that a person inherits the mutation of the family and lives to an old age without developing breast cancer, although that doesn't happen all that often. Um, finally, notice that here we do see in this man pancreatic cancer, and there's someone with I think in this family, with prostate cancer as well. So it's a somewhat more complex story than in the family that, that Broca described in the Traité. Now, BRCA1 acts, acts as a tumor suppressor gene, which means that, that when it was first identified, we didn't know what its function was at the molecular level, but it was clear from the genetic evidence that loss of, complete loss of function of BRCA1, that is loss of loss of function of both copies of the gene was necessary for cancer to develop. How do we know that? We know that because everyone in the family who has just, just the inherited mutation is fine in, as long as that's all that's gone wrong. But when a second mutation occurs in the same gene, specifically in a cell of the breast ductal epithelium or the ovarian epithelium, that, that is the, the kind of shell that covers the ovary, then there is no functional BRCA1, and then cancer develops. It was not clear when BRCA1 was, when we first identified BRCA1, or then when it was first, when it was first cloned and the amino acid sequence determined, it was not clear at the molecular level why that was true, because we didn't yet know the function of the gene. This is one of those situations in which a gene was identified by genetic and genomic approaches without knowing its function, which can be done. We, we now understand what reverse genetics can do, and one can then identify the function through the genetics rather than the other way around. So this family, and 
virtually all families with inherited mutations in this gene are examples of a two-hit tumor suppressor model in which cancer develops when but only when the one inherited mutation is accompanied by a second mutation in the same gene in the cell of the target tissue. As you would expect, this means that not only are women with inherited mutations in BRCA1 at a much, much higher risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer, but they're at risk of developing it younger. Why is that? Well, contrast what must happen for breast cancer to develop in a, in a woman in this family who has a mutation in this gene. She need have only one additional mutation in any cell of the breast or any cell of the ovary in BRCA1 for cancer to develop. Whereas in a woman who does not have a mutation in this gene, two successive mutations have to occur in the same cell lineage for the same event to happen. Now, why, we're, we will see in a moment just how high the risks of developing cancer are for women who are BRCA1 mutation carriers, and they're very high. Why are they high? Because BRCA1 lives in a bad neighborhood. That is, it's very easy for somatic mutations to occur in this gene because the locus, the BRCA1 total locus of about 84 KB is almost half ALU sequence. The same little 350 base pair repeat just jammed into every intron and flanking intergenic regions. This means that during mitosis, mispairing and therefore misalignment is extremely common. That's, of course, true of everyone. It has no, nothing to do with whether one has an inherited mutation or not. But for the rest of us, it doesn't matter because we still have a normal copy of BRCA1 on the other allele, and that cell just divides away and disappears after a while. But if one is in a family of this sort and has a mutation on the other allele, one bad replication event in a breast ductal epithelial cell is enough to completely lose BRCA1 function and really open the floodgates to proliferation and development, about, of course, more in a bit. Let me show you this family, which was one on the, on the, on the video, because I want to make a couple of points about it. Almost all of the mutations that matter in BRCA1 and in the sister genes of BRCA1 are the kind that I showed you in the previous family. That is, they are stops. They are either nonsense mutations, or they are frame shifts that lead to stops, or they're big genomic deletions of the entire gene. There are a few exceptions of which this is one, and this is, of course, a missense mutation that leads to a, the loss of a cysteine at an absolutely critical domain and its replacement by a glycine. And this critical domain is just here on the BRCA1, BARD1, heterodimer. And this beautiful structure, which looks to me like, a, like, like two ballet dancers doing a pas de deux, this beautiful structure has several features. One of its structural features is that in both the BRCA1 part of the structure, here and here, and its partner, BARD1, here and here, there are cysteine and histidine residues that have the job of binding zinc atoms that hold the structure together. And this missense mutation destroys one of those zinc binding structures. The job of this entire heterodimer is to act as an E3 ubiquitin ligase. That is, to ubiquitinate, to add a ubiquitin atom, specifically to a very important target, namely the estrogen receptor. So this means that when it's working properly, this beautiful structure prepares the estrogen receptor for being properly processed by the cell, so it turns over. We hypothesize, although we don't actually yet, even 20 years after the gene was cloned, have direct evidence for this, we hypothesize that what happens when, when BRCA1 is destroyed by, in this case, by destruction of this zinc, zinc binding ring domain, and therefore the heterodimer is completely out of balance, is that there's not ubiquitination of the estrogen receptor, there's therefore, the estrogen receptor therefore remains active, and the cell continues to pump in estrogen. 
buffering it from the effects of somatic mutation of BRCA1. So that instead of the cell simply dying if it has loss of BRCA1 function in other ways, I'll tell you about that in a bit, it instead continues to grow and proliferate. This, this discovery of this role, this ubiquitin ligase role of this domain, also explains why the cancers that are related to loss of BRCA1 function or BARD1 function are specifically the cancers that are related to estrogen metabolism or to ster other steroid metabolisms like androgen metabolism. That is because of this ubiquitin ligase role. It, until this was sorted out by my friend Rachel Clevett, who's a very fine structural biologist, until this was sorted out, it was a complete mystery why the cancers that we see in, in persons with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations are breast, ovary, some pancreas, as I'll show you in a few minutes now, increasing evidence of prostate, but not colon, not lung, not skin. That is, cancers that are really hormone dependent. And it's probably because of this link. Obviously, parenthetically, obviously it doesn't mean that those other cancers don't occur in people with mutations, but they don't occur above just background rates. So <laughs> what I want to do next is tell you the best evidence for what the risks of breast and ovarian cancer are that are associated with mutations in these genes. And the data that I'm going to show you is from people of Caucasian ancestry, but I expect that it's going to be the same when we have comparable data for people of Chinese ancestry. And that data is shown here. So the risk of developing either breast or ovarian cancer, and I've combined them on this slide, for women with a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, which is a sister gene of BRCA1, and a, another part of that complex, is, as you see, for BRCA1, by age 70 or so, it's 80%, extremely high. For BRCA2 carriers, by age 70 or so, is probably 60, a little more than 60%, also extremely high. So this is... This is, a, this is a level of risk about which we would really like to be able to do something. There's another reality that underlies this slide. This, this result, which, which is a recent result, but it echoed one from my lab 11 years before this, which said exactly the same thing, uh, was extremely controversial. And it was controversial in part because Getting the, getting the mathematics right was not trivial. But it was also controversial in part because many groups who were trying to sort out the risks associated with mutations in these genes were looking back at data that went back many decades and then following forward people in time. Now, fair enough. But they were, in other words, the data was much older, whereas this data was based still on following some people forward in time, but much more recent, uh, recently born people. The reason that matters is this. These are the same women who were on the previous slide. But here, what I've done, rather than separate the, the cohort of women that we followed by gene, is I've separated them by when they were born. So women born before 1958, there's nothing magical about 1958. I just wanted to separate all the women in the cohort into two equal sized groups. And 1958 was the mid, the mid birth year point. So women born in the earlier part of the cohort have this risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer if they carry a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2. Women in the same families, so the daughters of, of the women on the black line, their daughters who were born more recently have, as you see, much, much higher risks. Same mutations, same families, but the ages at onset have been pushed younger. Now, part of that is due to improvements in diagnosis, but that's only a small part. This is a really drastic increase in risk at any one age for women with the same mutations. Why does, and this, this result has now been replicated over and over again in every population where it's, been, where it's been studied. Why is this true? It can't be genetics. Everybody on this slide has the same 
the same set of mutations are all from the same families. This represents, I think, a change in non-genetic risk factors for breast cancer, and in particular, a change in the prevalence of those risk factors. So let's think for a moment <laughs> about epidemiology rather than about genetics. So one reality of breast cancer is that it has been increasing in incidence worldwide for the last 100 years or so. And the, the rate of that increase has varied a lot place by place. And for China in particular, that increase has come just in the last approximately 30 years and has been extremely rapid, and more rapid in Hong Kong than on the mainland, but now rapidly catching up on the mainland. Breast cancer is unique among cancers and virtually unique among diseases generally in that, in that it is a disease of development, not of underdevelopment, but of development. Breast cancer is more common in wealthier societies. Now, why is this? There's been very good data going back now for oh, 70 years that the two principal non-genetic risk factors for breast cancer are the following. The age at which a girl enters puberty, that is the age at which a girl begins to menstruate, and the age at which a young woman has her first child. And the direction of those risks are that the younger a girl begins to menstruate and the older the age at which she has her first child, in other words, the length of that interval during which she's fertile but not bearing children, the longer that interval, the higher the subsequent breast cancer risk, regardless of inherited mutation or not. So think of a couple of things. What's happened in this country in the last generation? Nutrition of young girls has improved remarkably so that age administration has dropped by a couple of years just in one generation among Chinese women, Chinese girls. And education of young women has improved remarkably so that ages at first childbirth have increased dramatically among Chinese young women. So if we think back, say, three generations, among Chinese women, the average difference in years between the age at beginning to menstruate and the age at having a first child was probably six or seven years, about age 15 to about age 21, 22. Now, that interval is probably from about average age 11 to average age over 30, maybe 20 years. We can model the entire increased risk of breast cancer apart from the inherited genetics part based on those facts alone. So what happens when we add in, when we integrate into that, the reality of inherited predisposition? What it does is push the, the onset curve to a younger age. It doesn't mean that it was ever low risk to have one of these genes. The risk here is still very high, but it's much, much higher now. So what does this mean? Well, it does not mean we should go back to not having good nutrition for young girls or not educating young women, right? Definitely not going to do that. This is our show, right? What it does mean is that we have to think through how to address these challenges. So when, when BRCA1 was first cloned back in the mid-1990s, and then very shortly thereafter, when its sister gene BRCA2 was cloned just a year later, because in that interval, one didn't have to do positional cloning anymore. The genome project came online. Uh, there, it was possible to, to begin to follow women who learned by virtue of the genes now being available to sequence, whether they had mutations in one of these genes. It was possible to learn what happened under different circumstances to those women by following them forward in time. So here's that data. <laughs> this is from a large consortium of hospitals. I was not personally involved in this. I'm just reporting a really nice project undertaken by others uh, of women of various ancestries. It doesn't matter if they were European ancestry, Chinese ancestry, African ancestry, mix of ancestries, each of whom learned that she carried a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, and she learned that at time zero. And then and, and this study was begun in the mid-90s, just after both genes were cloned. 
And then when these women learned this reality, they had the choice of having their ovaries and fallopian tubes removed or not. And most, well, in this particular study, about half chose to have ovaries and fallopian tubes removed and about half chose not to. And as you can see, they were then followed forward in time and among those who chose what's called a salpingo oophorectomy, so this is removal of the ovaries, that's oophorectomy, and fallopian tubes, that's the salpingo part. The, the proportion of those women who developed either ovarian cancer or fallopian tube cancer or indeed breast cancer is shown here. So it's, it's about, what is it, about well, maybe 10% over a period of seven years. In contrast, among those who had good surveillance but did not undertake the surgery, the proportion who developed ovarian or breast cancer or fallopian tube cancer by even by about four years was about 30%. So a huge difference, just a drastic difference. So this, and this was observational. There was, there was no randomization here. This is just a natural study. So this raises a couple of questions. Bear in mind that this study was undertaken just after both genes were cloned and women in several dozen hospitals were followed. So very different levels of advice, different levels of encouragement to do one thing or the other. Everything was still pretty loose because it was brand new science. The first question I asked is why does removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes have anything to do with the risk of breast cancer? I can certainly imagine that removing ovaries and fallopian tubes would reduce the risk of ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. That makes sense. But why breast? The reason turns out to be that when the ovaries and fallopian tubes of a premenopausal woman, woman are removed, and almost always that woman then takes some level of replacement estrogen so she'll have a good quality of life until she would normally undergo menopause at about age 50, it's nonetheless true that the amount of estrogen that she needs in order to have a good quality of life is much, much less than her body would be making naturally. This is another way of saying that we women are the most successful mammals there have ever been. We are the most fabulous, best mammals ever developed, and we've developed ourselves. And I mean, we are, we are fertile younger in our life cycle, we remain fertile longer, our cognitive abilities remain high longer, we have been fabulous because we have extremely high levels of estrogen. But we don't need those extremely high levels all the time. And in particular, women who have very, very high risk of breast and ovarian cancer because of mutations in these genes do fine with a level of estrogen in their 40s that is about, well, typically about a third of what they're, of what they're producing endogenously. So, so the risk of breast cancer is reduced because there's simply not as much estrogen pumping through the system of a woman who's had her ovaries removed, even though she replaces the estrogen with medication. The other thing I said to myself is, why are there any cases of ovarian cancer in, in the group of women who had salpingoophorectomies, it doesn't make sense. The reason for that is kind of a historic reason. Uh, the, as I'll show you in a minute, the recommendation for women who have mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 that was developed as a result of this study and several others like it, is that a woman who learns that she has a mutation in one of these genes be recommended to have this surgery when she's about age 40. So about 10 years before she would go through menopause naturally and after she's finished having her children. The, the formal recommendation is actually that she consider this surgery after she's finished childbearing. Fair enough. But appreciate that as the genes were cloned, women were whatever age they were. Some were 40, but some were 50 or 55 or whatever. And so if they decided to have the surgery, and suppose a woman is 50 and she decides to have the surgery, it may very well be that she already has a latent ovarian cancer and it was only detected at the time of the surgery. So in this study, there's a fair amount of that. So this study and others like it made the point very dramatically, you don't need statistics to show you that that's different, uh, that, this, that this surgery was extremely helpful. Now, I'm going to come back to that point <laughs> in a moment, but I first want to address the question of 
What about women who, who we don't learn about genetically until after their breast or ovarian cancer is diagnosed? Is there any way that we can exploit the, the fact of mutations in these genes to develop treatments for cancer? And that took about 20 years to happen because the biology is really tough. And let me take you through it just really very straightforwardly. It turns out <laughs> that the natural role, the normal function of BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are totally different from each other in primary sequence, but which, which complex along with BARD1 and, and multiple other proteins, that their natural function as a complex is to control the major pathway of DNA repair, which is the homologous recombination pathway that's shown here. So when DNA breaks happen, which of course happens to cells under normal circumstances very frequently, under normal healthy circumstances, the normal course of repair is repair by homologous recombination as shown in this little sketch that involves BRCA1, BRCA2, RAD50, various RAD51 components, and, they, and the, the DNA is repaired and all is well. There is a minor pathway that is error prone, but that also exists in all mammalian cells or all vertebrate cells called the alternate injoining repair pathway, and that's shown here. Now, why does this matter? This matters because when both copies of BRCA1 are mutant, one by virtue of inheritance and the other by virtue of a tissue-specific mutation like we were talking about earlier, then this pathway is no longer functional. This beautiful, powerful, error-free, homologous recombination pathway. That means that under normal circumstances when breaks occur in cells, or in DNA in cells, all the repair is forced into this alternate injoining pathway. And it, it ha repair happens, but it doesn't happen all that well, and we end up with, with repaired DNA and with some additional errors added. It was observed almost as soon as these genes were cloned that in women treated with conventional good chemotherapy, cisplatin or carboplatin chemotherapy for ovarian cancer, that paradoxically, women who had mutations in BRCA1 or in BRCA2, so their ovarian cancers were in fact really aggressive because they were, let's say, BRCA1 null, actually responded better to conventional good chemotherapy than did women with ovarian cancer who did not have inherited mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. And the reasoning, as, as all of this biology got sorted out, the reasoning was that the cisplatin, carboplatinum chemotherapy was causing more mutations here, more, therefore more sh pushing of the, of the, of the um, repair down this pathway, and cells weren't surviving as well. And this led two groups, one the group of Alan Ashworth in London and the other group of Thomas Halliday in, in Stockholm, to think independently of a way of, of making this process even more powerful. And what they did, what each of those, their groups did, was develop an inhibitor of the major enzyme of this pathway. And the major enzyme of this pathway is called PARP. And so their drug is an inhibitor of PARP. So what, is, what happens then? If you give an inhibitor of PARP to a patient who has, let's say, an inherited mutation in BRCA1 and a tissue-specific mutation in BRCA1 that has led her to develop ovarian cancer, it looks like this. DNA repair or DNA damage happens, in, per in particular if you are treating her with cisplatin, which is a mutagen. She cannot repair by the homologous recombination pathway. You've just inhibited this pathway by inhibiting PARP, so she can't repair at all in her tumor, and so the tumor cells die. Bravo. Her, the rest of her cells are still fine is probably a little bit of a stretch, but they're still okay because in all of her other cells, she still has one normal copy of BRCA1, right? So the only cells that have no functional copies of BRCA1 are the cancer cells. 
So this is a totally terrific idea. It's called synthetic lethality because what you've created is a way for your conventional chemotherapy to be lethal in a synthetic fashion because here's the way you've created the synthetic lethality. It's it's absolutely fabulous idea. Now, the as we learn more and more and more about the biochemistry behind all of this, it's clear that what I just showed you is part of the story, but probably not all of the story. And I commend to those of you who do biochemistry that what I've shown you is this part of the story, but there have been in the last few years several other ways that, that the PARP-driven pathway, that is the alternate enjoining pathway, and other related PARP-involved pathways, and the homologous recombination repair pathway all play roles in this process, and there are multiple different um, sort of combinations of these. What I told you is kind of the, the really the, the basic outline, but I do commend to you any of these really nice um, reviews. On, well, this, this, one's, this is what I already, this one's an older review, just the basic idea of, of um, homologous recombination or repair, and the Lee and Yu paper gives you a, fa a feel for all the different ways that both of these pathways play a role. The Daniel Mall of all this is that the idea of synthetic lethality is a very powerful one. Now, how does this play out in the clinic? It plays out like this. <laughs> so here's some data from now, a couple of years ago, that really nailed it in terms of the power of combining PARP inhibitor chemotherapy uh, with cisplatin chemotherapy, which is conventional state-of-the-art chemotherapy, for patients who have originally ovarian cancer, which is now extending to breast, uh, and mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. So let me tell you a little bit about this, about this uh, clinical trial in detail. Oops. Thank you. Uh, and, and, why, and, and what it revealed to us about biology in addition to the importance of the trial. So this was a randomized trial. These were patients who had, who had already been treated for their ovarian cancers, and their ovarian cancers were sensitive to, they were now recurrent, but were sensitive to platinum upon recurrence. So these are women who are very sick, but they are, their tumors are still responding to platinum chemotherapy. And women were um, randomly assigned to either receive PARP inhibitor or not. And then, after the fact, this is not the way one would want the study designed, but it was the way it was designed. After the fact, it was determined who carried mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 and who did not. So the top panel <laughs> are women who carried inherited mutations in BRCA1 or, or BRCA2 of the sort I showed you on the, on the early slides. And the top line are women who were randomized to receive PARP inhibitor in addition to platinum chemotherapy. And the bottom line are women who were randomized to receive placebo in addition to platinum chemotherapy. And this is the median number of months until recurrence. So obviously a tremendous difference, fabulous difference. The middle panel are women for whom there was no detected inherited mutation, either because the test had not been done or because the test had been done but no mutation was detected. But when you observe the tumor, the tumors were in fact deficient in homologous recombination repair, suggesting that something was wrong with BRCA1 or BRCA2, even if you hadn't detected it. And those women had also been randomized, everybody was randomized in advance. And there's still a dramatic difference in the months until recurrence of the ovarian cancer among those randomized to PARP as part of their treatment and those randomized to not receive PARP as part of their treatment. And then this third group are women, are basically all the other women in whom the, the nature of the uh, homologous recombination repair pathway in the tumor was not quite clear. But there's still a difference, and what this tells me is that there's more than one way to lose the homologous recombination repair capacity. Uh, what I've to everything I've, we've talked about so far are actually genomic lesions, either inherited mutations or somatic mutations, but you can imagine a situation in which epigenetics could play a major role, 
or in which mutations in other genes in that complex could play a major role. So it suggests that PARP inhibitor therapy among women whom, for whom we can pin down something that has gone wrong with homologous recombination repair is a very powerful adjunctive treatment. So everything I've told you so far led to international guidelines to apply to all women who learn that they have a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2. So this is, there's something called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is actually international, um, made up of oncologists and surgeons who work with these patients who discussed for, well, they actually, it's ongoing, so they, they revise this every year. Uh, for guidelines under a whole variety of circumstances, and these are the circumstances of having a mutation in one of these genes. What do they recommend? They recommend that a woman who learns that she has a mutation in BRCA1 or the sister gene BRCA2, same classes of mutations, have an annual mammogram or breast MRI screening from a very early age, 25, that she discuss with her physician the option of risk-reducing mastectomy, although nothing I've talked about so far is actually mastectomy-driven, and that she actually undertake removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes between the ages of 35 and 40 or upon completion of childbearing. And that, I've actually quoted this directly, which is a very strong thing for a committee to say. It's a surgery, after all. And with the uh, understanding that she will have possible short-term hormone replacement therapy until she would normally begin menopause. Now, I put this next line in here to remind me to tell you that when this recommendation came out, there was a concern that this, that, that uh, putting women into early menopause, even with replacement hormone therapy, was going to increase their heart disease risk. So a group led by Steve Narod at Toronto undertook an enormous study of women who did, this was a natural history study, it wasn't a randomized study, uh, of women who did go through this process. And it took until 2014 to assemble this because, of course, women were getting older. And they found an overall 77% 77 77 reduction in causes, in all causes of mortality, that is, in mortality from, for any reason cancer, heart disease, stroke, any reason among women who had had this risk-reducing salpingoophorectomy and, of course, carried mutations in one of these genes. So clearly, this is an overall tremendous benefit in terms of longevity of mutation carriers. And any, um, any additional risk of death due to other causes is, is minimal compared to the benefit of uh, of um, not developing breast and ovarian cancer. And then what we just talked about is treatment, namely that PARP inhibitor therapy be used for women who have uh, ovarian or breast cancer that completely lacks function of one of these genes. <laughs> so what all this suggests is that it would be really useful for a woman to know if she carries a mutation in one of these genes. Fair enough? Why is that not a trivial thing to find out? Well, in my view, it should be a trivial thing to find out, but it wasn't. It hasn't been. And there are really three reasons. The first is that about half of women who have mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 have no close family history of breast or ovarian cancer, unlike the families I showed you already. We'll come back to why that's true. Second reason is that until modern genomic tools became available, it was technically very difficult to sort this out because there are thousands of different mutations in BRCA1 and thousands of different mutations in BRCA2. Um, many of them are private to one family. I mean, there's basically an unlimited number of these mutations. I mean, think about frame shifts. You can have a deletion or an insertion of one or two or four or five or six or seven and so on. Or six won't, six won't do anything, seven or eight base pairs, and you can do that in a huge variety of ways and have a stop. And that can only be sorted out by sequencing, and until we had modern genomics, that was a slog. Doing all that by Sanger sequencing was very, very slow and labor intensive. And then third reason is that, as, as I've already intimated, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are not the only genes involved. So let me show you, this was also on the video, 
this is, these are two families from one of our studies in which our goal in these studies was just to find out how much inherited breast cancer there was out there among breast cancer patients. And here are two patients, this one and this one, who, when they developed their breast cancers, entered our study, and we discovered to our surprise and theirs that this woman had a mutation in BRCA1 and this woman had a mutation in BRCA2, even though, as you see, there's no breast cancer or ovarian cancer in their families. As you now know, because you've seen it in the video, that's because in each case the mutation was inherited from the father. And the sisters of our index patients were just lucky. They didn't inherit the same mutation from the father. So the combination of small families, paternal inheritance, and good luck le leads to the reality that about half of mutation carriers have no idea. So we would like to find their mutations before they develop cancer. The second problem, the second challenge, is that, as I said, there are thousands of different mutations in each gene. This cartoon, which, I, which is no longer being updated because it's gotten too crowded, um, is a cartoon originally made by some folks at NIH where every vertical line represents a different mutation along the BRCA1 sequence. Here's the 5 prime end and here's the 3 prime end. Or a different mutation along the BRCA2 sequence, 5 prime end, 3 prime end. And they get pretty crowded. Just about everything that can go wrong will. And then the third problem that I alluded to is that there are a lot of different genes involved. The, the, the basic biology is that any gene that makes a protein that's involved in homologous recombination repair, when it undergoes mutation, leads to increased risk of breast or ovarian cancer or both. Not all to the same degree as BRCA1 and BRCA2, but to varying degrees. They do matter. And here are simply some of these genes. And the, the, the nature of this, this is my effort to be artistic, the nature of this cartoon is that the size of the symbol represents the size of the protein or the length of the coding sequence, and the, the color represents the degree of risk associated with loss of function of that, of that gene. And all of these genes form uh, repair complexes, some called by us the BRCA complexes, called by people who work on Fanconi anemia, the Fanconi anemia complex, same complex. So, Confronted with these realities and with the emergence in, in 2009 of next generation sequencing in a form that it could be used by labs of, like mine, which are medium sized labs, not big genome centers, um, Tom Walsh in my lab developed a really nice tool that allowed us to simultaneously sequence at great depth all of the genes that are in the homologous recombination repair pathway and some candidate genes that we weren't sure if they were or not in the DNA, genomic DNA, from any, any patient or indeed any person who was interested in knowing if they carried a mutation in one of these genes. And it was a gene panel. It was the first gene panel developed after exome panels. And we named it, of course, for Broca. And Coincidentally and nicely, it also is breast and ovarian cancer. And the, the, our goal, or Tom's goal, in developing this panel was to enable us to, was to make a one-stop shop, to enable us to detect all classes of mutations in all known and candidate breast and ovarian cancer genes. And this method of, of determining gene sequence was much less expensive and much less labor intensive and much more thorough and much more accurate than the older Sanger sequencing based methods. Uh, it had cost previously by Sanger sequencing for commercial sequencing $3,800 for sequencing BRCA1 and BRCA2, tremendous amount of money. And with Broca, it costs about $200 to sequence all the genes on that previous slide that I showed you, all of those. Now, let me show you one other technical thing. Uh, I said all mutations of all classes, and I meant it. We developed a tool for identifying mutations that are very large, not point mutations, but, we, but are deletions of large pieces of BRCA1, as here. So here's 5 prime end of BRCA1, 3 prime end of BRCA1, and this is a deletion of exons 14 to 20. Here's a duplication of exon 13. Here's a deletion of the whole first part of the gene. 
and we can identify those mutations by copy number differences. So one can very easily sort all of this out. This was a challenge in the states um, for a few years after we developed the tool because the company that had actually positionally cloned BRCA1 after we identified its position back in 1990, four years later, the gene was actually positionally cloned, but not by me, by a company called Myriad Genetics, and they patented it. And they did not share the patent. You couldn't, you couldn't pay a fee and use the information. Um, so no one was allowed to sell sequencing services except this one company, which had a couple of consequences. It kept the price very high, and it really inhibited development of new technology applied to this problem. A lot of places ignored this patent, but in the States it was impossible to ignore. But also in the States in 2013, our Supreme Court overturned the patent. A, 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 a coalition of advocacy groups and physicians and the American Civil Liberties Union brought a suit against Myriad saying that this was denying, uh, denying women the opportunity to learn critical information and that a gene was a natural product. It was a part of the body. It wasn't patentable. And the Supreme Court accepted that logic, nine to nothing. This is something that does not happen in America very often, but it happened. <laughs> And in June of 2013, they overturned the Myriad patent, and they said genes cannot be patented. And because, of course, we had BROCA up and running, and we were using it in research, obviously we weren't marketing anything, but we were using it in research, we had not patented BROCA. So it was being, the oligos that made it up were being ordered by hospitals and companies and all sorts of groups all over, well, all over the world by 2013. By the next morning, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 sequencing was online. So that it was one of those situations where there had been a block in place for a non-scientific reason. You remove that block and the technology is immediately available. And the price now has gone from $3,800 to $200 or sometimes even less depending on if there are specials. So, <laughs> so we undertook, as you would expect, during this time that the patent was still in force, but we were just doing this for research purposes, we undertook a couple of studies. And let me show you just a couple of examples, and then I'll, I'll show you what, what's known thus far about this, this uh, profile in Chinese women, which is just getting off the ground. Um, the first thing that we asked ourselves is, among, so I've, of course, been doing this now for 40 years, and I've worked with many thousands of families that are severely affected with breast or ovarian cancer, like, of course, the families I showed you. Among the families that do not have mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, what's up? What's happening? And with BRCA, we can sequence many other genes also, and in families of mixed American ancestry. So there's a little bit of everything in here. Here's what's happening. The, the, the families that don't have mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, we find that about 20% of those families are solved by a, by a equally bad mutation but in another gene of any of these rainbow of different genes. So this is the kind of, of profile you might expect if you've already resolved all the BRCA1 and BRCA2 cases, but you still have many unsolved families. My friends Liz Swisher and Barbara Norquist, both of whom are surgeons who work with patients with ovarian cancer, gynecologic oncologists, undertook a, a somewhat different study, a more systematic study, actually. What they did was identify every ovarian cancer patient who came through our hospital over a period of several years, so hundreds of such patients, and they sequenced every one of those patients using BRCA, and in ovarian, and again, mixed ancestry, American patients, among patients with ovarian cancer not selected for family history, not selected at regardless of any age at diagnosis, 18% of those patients had a mutation in one of the genes on BRCA, mostly BRCA1, second most BRCA2, and so on, as you see here. That means that had these women known this in advance, they would not have developed ovarian cancer, right? Because they would have had salpingulophorectomies. So we could have gotten rid of 18% of ovarian cancer just like that 
if everyone had been screened when she, you know, before, at some age before her ovarian cancer was, was obvious. I want to point out a couple of other issues here. First, of these hundreds of patients who had mutations in one of these genes, a third of them were diagnosed with their ovarian cancers after age 60. Ovarian cancer is a pretty late onset disease. It's virtually always fatal. Um, and these patients can be assisted by PARP inhibitors, regardless of whether they're BRCA1 or BRCA2 or one of these other genes, because all these genes are involved in mismatch repair. So even if we don't catch the mutation carrier as a carrier before she develops her cancer, we should be testing her when she develops her cancer to see if she will be benefited by PARP inhibitor or not. Part of this story was for Barbara Norquist to sort out the role of each of these genes in risk of ovarian cancer. And as you see, there are very increased risks. These are odds ratios uh, for ovarian cancer for a whole lot of these genes. Let me show you next. I just made this slide last night. Does it work? Yeah, it works. Um, this is the first data among Chinese women with breast cancer. And this data is from my friends at Color Genomics, which is a firm that has been doing some testing um, here in collaboration with physicians here in, in Hong Kong and in China. And these are women of, of genetically Chinese ancestry who have developed breast cancer. And we don't yet have a bead on what proportion of all of breast cancer in China is going to be attributable to one of these genes. The, the data is too young yet to know that. But as you see, the, the, the um, distribution of genes that, are, that appear is pretty much the same as in other populations. Having said that, the mutations themselves are completely different. Everything that can go wrong will. <laughs> so the, a mutation in a family from Norway is different than a mutation in a family from Sweden. Indeed, in Sweden, I don't know if you knew this, but in the southern part of Sweden, there are three different glacial valleys. There is a BRCA1 mutation that is characteristic of each of those valleys. In Norway, along the west coast, there are a series of islands. There is a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation characteristic of each of these islands. So mutations in Chinese women are both different from each other, depending on where the family is originally from in China, and they're different from mutations elsewhere. Doesn't matter. We have BRCA. We can sequence everybody completely. It's not a challenge anymore technologically at all to find these mutations. So let me now talk about one of my favorite subjects, men. <laughs> Everything I've said so far has been about women, right? All right. So I haven't, I haven't talked yet about BRCA2, but now I will, and I will in the context of men. BRCA2 is a sister gene of BRCA1. As I said, it's completely different in primary sequence, but it's part of this beautiful complex that, that drives homologous recombination repair. And this is one of our first BRCA2 families. This is American family of Dutch ancestry. And as you see, there's an a extraordinary amount of, of breast cancer in men in these families, in this family. Um, the, all these men are fertile. I haven't put the entire pedigree up, but all the men are fertile. It's not that they have any Klinefelter syndrome. They are, they are, uh, there's, all of their hormonal levels are fine. They just have a lot of breast cancer. Clearly, women who carry the mutation do as well, in fact, at much younger ages. All of these men survived their breast cancers because their breast cancers were relatively slow growing and they were detected at very early stages. But clearly, there are families, and disproportionately BRCA2 families, that are like this. I haven't figured out yet why this particular family is so very severely affected. It's, it's not typical. This is the most extreme family I've ever seen. I just wanted to show it to you for that reason. But, it, but they do exist. The next thing I want to show you is much commoner. It's another BRCA2 family that, that we originally enrolled because this woman, who's a friend of mine, um, learned that she carried a mutation in BRCA2 because her mother had carried such a mutation and died of breast cancer. But when we explored the family in greater detail, Look at what the cancers are that are actually popping up among people with mutations. If you look at the men with mutations, prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, prostate, prostate, I'm having a little trouble reading it, prostate, prostate, 
breast in a woman, and so on. So there's a great deal of prostate cancer in this family among the mutation carriers. So this and other stories like this led my friends uh, Heather Chang and Colin Pritchard, who are married to each other and have a fabulous son named Rex, to broke a sequence, a, a large series of men with prostate cancer who had presented at our center and neighboring centers in the Pacific Northwest with, with a very particular form of prostate cancer. Do you know what Gleason scores are? Gleason scores are a way of, of staging prostate cancer. And the scores in principle run from one to 10, where 10 is the, the most aggressive. And a score of eight or higher is considered very aggressive and, and indeed metastatic. So they, were, they studied, sequenced, uh, genomic DNA from men who had prostate cancer that presented as a Gleason eight or higher, so a really aggressive prostate cancer. And among these men, 12% of them had a mutation in one of the BRCA genes, as shown here. So again, these are men whose, whose prostate cancer might, might very well still have happened, but had we known about them in advance, they could have had much more assiduous scrutiny, and hopefully their prostate cancers would have been detected way before they were metastatic. So what's everything I've told you so far? There are some shared themes in all of this. That is, in these genes, mutations are individually rare. Lots of them are specific or private to one family, but collectively they're quite common. That we see inherited and somatic mutations in the same gene. That the critical genes, when they go bad, when they're mutant, lead to loss of DNA repair. And that somatic events, whether they're genomic or epigenetic, in the same genes have the same effect as inherited mutations. If you lose a function, you lose a function. It doesn't matter why it happened. And that these, these effects are genetically heterogeneous. That is, this person will have mutation in BRCA1. This person will have mutation in BRCA2. This person will have mutation in ATM. This person will have mutation in BARD1. But in almost all cases, a person has a mutation in only one gene. It's not polygenic. It's heterogeneous person to person but there's one bad thing that happens to each person. What about the families we haven't solved yet? This is what we're doing now. We're using whole genome sequencing to try to understand what about the families that are severely affected but don't have mutations that we can detect by BRCA in any of the known genes. We've already exome sequenced hundreds of these families. We have not discovered any new genes by exome sequencing that hadn't already been detected by someone in from exome sequencing, typically, in, in a family already. We've discovered additional mutations, but not additional genes. There's about 20, 22 genes now that are critical. You've seen them on those pie charts. Um, and we haven't found any new genes. What I think we'll find are distant regulators, either distant enhancers, distant repressors that control the known genes. Indeed, we could find deep entronic events that control the known genes that we've not, that we've missed, even though in principle we should have seen them. So the very last theme, why is genetic testing important? We've already found three reasons. For prevention, albeit through surgery that is not fun, for treatment, and then so we can work with the younger brothers and sisters and children of people that we learn have mutations. So all this led me in 2014 when I won the last year that, that Dr. Ipso kindly referred to. To, so when you win the, win the Lasker, it, it is the practice of JAMA to offer you the opportunity to write a commentary. At least it was their practice at the time. They may have dropped it in consequence of my commentary. But anyway, I wrote a commentary <coughs> that was a proposition. And the proposition was that every woman be offered complete sequencing of BRCA1 and BRCA2 at about age 30 as part of her routine medical care. She goes to her gynecologist and along with all of her other exams, a, a blood sample is taken or a saliva sample is taken and BRCA sequencing is, or BRCA1 and BRCA2 sequencing is carried out. That if the woman has a severe family history that's not resolved by a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, that she be referred for testing for all of the genes on BRCA. And then that every woman that has an unambiguously damaging mutation be referred to a high-risk clinic for appropriate medical follow-up. Now. This proposition just 
all hell broke loose when I wrote this proposition in 2014. And indeed, JAMA, they published it. They were as good as their word. But they, wrote, they had in big red letters across the top of the online access, uh, the views of this commentary represent the views of Dr. King. They do not necessarily represent the views of the JAMA editorial board. I got to tell you, that red banner is not there anymore. Just saying. So what were the issues? There were several, and these have by and, these are either in the process of being resolved or have been resolved. The first concern was the technical quality of the sequencing. That is really now resolved. We have, in very rapid order, got genome sequencing down. The kinds of things that were a concern, a real concern, at the time were, what about underlying pseudogenes? With, what about all those ALUs? I mean, they were real technical issues, but both the hardware, the chemistry, and the software has all really rendered this moot in the hands of people who know what they're doing. There are, of course, people who don't know what they're doing to screw this up royally, but in the hands of either public or private sector uh, sequencing um, entities that know how to sequence, this is no longer an issue. Interpretation is an issue. Um, there's something called a variant of unknown significance, which is basically a variant in one of these genes whose consequence you don't know. And it's just that. That will always be true in human, in any kind of genetics. And my view is that for clinical application, those are not the variants we're talking about. We're talking about mutations of the kinds I have been talking with you about for the past hour. Mutations that unquestionably stop the normal function of the gene. And we need to interpret genome sequencing data in that light, clinically relevant mutations. Third concern was yield. What fraction of healthy 30-year-old women are going to carry a mutation in one of these genes? I think for the mixed ancestry U.S. population as a whole, the answer is about 1 percent. About 1 percent of people will carry a mutation that is unquestionably, unambiguously damaging in BRCA1 or BRCA2 or one of the other BRCA genes. I don't know what that answer is going to be for China. My guess is about the same, but I don't know. Cost, cost is now much, much, much lower and is manageable, and of course it only needs to be done once. Then um, two obvious non-trivial things. Um, what about follow-up for women with mutations? That's a major cost. They need to have follow-up. They need to think about the surgical options. They need timing for this. They need scheduling for this. Of course, in the long run, it's not only life-saving, it's money-saving because you are saving a vast number of productive years of a person's life, and you're saving that life in a cancer-free fashion as opposed to the expense of treating a cancer patient. But the initial cost of follow-up for women with mutations is, is substantial. And then, of course, follow up for families where there is mutation, where there are mutations, to see who among the younger family members carries the same mutation. So all this is working itself out, and the the field seems to have gone from horror to, gosh, we knew this all along in a remarkably short period of time. And so we are now, I think, at the following at the following conclusion, that every breast ovarian cancer patient with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation that is detected after diagnosis is a missed opportunity to have prevented that cancer. No woman with a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 should die of breast or ovarian cancer. It is absolutely unnecessary and it is completely preventable. Thank you. Thank you, Professor King. We will now have the Q&A session conducted by Professor Karen Chen. Correction, Chen. Professor Karen Chen, please. Um, it's my great honor to be here today to help Professor King out. So we welcome questions, and we understand some of you are high school students, and my role here is your interpreter. If you feel very scared that you have to ask it in English, 
I'm here to translate to the best of my ability. So, or even answer the question. <laughs> we, we welcome any questions from, maybe we can start with students, and I'm sure we will have people running microphones in the, too. In the language of your choice. Or we could let faculty ask the first yeah, few. Yeah, or faculty can yeah. go ahead and... There's a, there's a student. Yay, brave student. Um, I want to ask that is that uh, you, you just mentioned that if there's mutation in like both copies of BRCA1 or BRCA2, uh, it will lead to cancer. It will lead to uh, uh, ovarian cancer or breast cancer if like there is some wrong in DNA replication. But uh, isn't that there's other, other ways that the, our cells can uh, regulate the DNA, like there are P53 that can, uh, that can repair the DNA or it will induce apoptosis if there's any wrong? Right. That's a very good question. Why should, uh, why should failure of repair lead to proliferation rather than cell death? And we're not sure of the answer. I mean, it's really a profound question, and it's the most profound remaining question of this field. We think that it has to do with the fact that the cells in which this phenomenon occurs have such a rich estrogen environment that they don't enter apoptosis, but instead survive. It's also the case that in virtually all of the ovarian and breast cancers that one observes, p53 mutations have already occurred. So the p53 mutations probably occur extremely early on in these patients, possibly even before the second somatic event uh, in the original BRCA gene. It's probably, therefore, some combination. But your question is exactly the critical remaining question in the field, and we don't know the answer for sure. We'd, if we did, what we'd like to do is drive those cells to apoptosis rather than wait for this to happen. Hello, hello. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, family tree about the men with breast cancer. So I was wondering if uh, the, the male with breast cancer, their offspring, will, uh, will they have breast cancers or ovarian cancers as well? Well, obviously they don't have ovarian cancer because anatomically uh, they're fine. I mean, I mean their offspring, will they also carry, like, like have a higher risk of having cancers? In, Do they have yeah. a higher risk, say, of prostate cancer? and? other cancers that men could develop? Yeah, yes. Uh, real, that's actually a very good question. We're not quite sure because now that, now that the prostate story is clearer, uh, one thing that, that Heather and Colin want to sort out is among mutation-carrying men who develop prostate cancer, are they more likely to develop breast? Because prostate cancer is a more common outcome than breast in these men. Uh, and that's brand new, and we don't know yet. So ask me in another year. I'll come back to visit. Ask me again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. for That was a very wonderful talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask if there has, there, has there been any cases in which the cancer was caused by an epigenetic mechanism instead of a mutation of the BRCA genes? We think so. We think so. Um, my friend Liz Swisher has been very interested in that question. And if you had asked me two weeks ago, I would have said that Liz has found a number of cases in which with, in a woman with one inherited mutation, she has found that the second event is epigenetic. So that's in, for ovary, that's fairly common. Maybe 10% of ovarian cancer in BRCA1 mutation carriers has as the second event an epigenetic event, a methylation, essentially a methylation event, rather than a, a, a somatic genomic event. Liz, just the other day, has a patient in which we think that 
there are two somatic BRCA1 events, one somatic genomic and one somatic epigenetic. So if, if, if that proves correct, then we'll have all three combinations that, that could be in play. So yeah, yeah, good call. And, and of course, as you guys know as well as I, epigenetics is hard to catch. It could, it could be an even larger player than we are aware so far. Hello, thank you for the talk. I wanted to know if the incidence of breast cancer in non-human primates is similar to that in humans, and uh, whether it's uh, if whether the, there are genes similar to BRCA1, maybe it's orthologs in primates that cause the same cancer. Right, great question. BRCA1 is conserved in, um, in non-human primates. Humans and chimpanzees share a feature of BRCA1 genomics that is not shared by the other primates that leads to a very high level of somatic events, and that is um, a duplication of the five prime end of the gene. So the first two exons, first two coding exons of BRCA1 and about 30 KB, five prime of that, are reduplicated in a really messy way in humans and in chimps and not in other primates. Um, so that's one fun fact, right? Uh, the other reality is that non-human primates very rarely develop um, mammary cancer. It can happen, but it's really rare. And the reason is very likely that they simply don't have the high levels of estrogens that humans have. Nancy knows more about this than I do, by a lot. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Very wonderful talk. Uh, I have a simple question that is the BRCA1 is uh, related to the exogen uh, receptor uh, ubiquitin. And uh, as a man or male, we don't have that high level of the exogen. Correct. Uh, Correct. But uh, you mentioned that the BRCA2 uh, mutation is related to the man male cancer. Right. So what's the role of the right. BRCA2? Oh gosh, you guys are good. It's another, that's another really fundamental question. Uh, I can tell you what we, the most honest answer is I don't know why we, men should have disproportionate BRCA2 mutations leading to breast cancer rather than BRCA1. It's not resolved. What I can tell you is that the ubiquitination function of BRCA1 that's directed at the estrogen receptor is, we believe, it's still very, very new evidence, um, also directed at the androgen receptor so that you can envision the entire complex acting in, on the androgen receptor in a way that is, is somewhat analogous to the way it acts on the estrogen receptor. But why? But that's still BRCA1 barred one. It's not the BRCA2 part of the complex. What is it about BRCA2 that leads both to male breast cancer and to prostate cancer more than BRCA1? And the answer is we do not yet know. If any of you are interested in coming to the US to do a postdoc on one of these themes, that would be really great. I've heard five different postdoc projects in the last five minutes. <laughs> right. Yeah, so no, then she says you have to come back home. <laughs> Hi, thank Hi. you for the very wonderful talk. So um, my question is, so both breast and ovarian cancer seems to be related to BRCA1 and BRCA2, mm -hmm. but it seems like breast cancer has a higher a uh, higher developing rate in women compared to ovarian cancer, but ovarian cancer is more deadly. Why so? And the next question would be, is there any mutation that is specifically related to the breast cancer in BRCA1 and BRCA2 or related to ovarian cancer? Right. Those are both really super questions. Uh, let's see, the first one was, uh, why more breast than ovary, right? Uh, that's somewhat, that's not true everywhere. It's somewhat dependent on those non-genetic risk factors for breast cancer. So in a part, in a part of the world where the non-genetic risk factors for breast cancer are still not prevalent, that is where, where girls begin to menstruate very late and have their children very early, there's much, much, much less breast cancer. And, but, but ovarian cancer rates are essentially unaffected. So one in those, I mean, obviously there are not a lot of places like that left, but 
to the extent that there are, we do see disproportionately more ovarian cancer than breast cancer. And moving back in history, we certainly saw disproportionately more ovarian cancer than we see now. So it, that's a reflection of the non-genetic risk factors for breast cancer, which are now extremely prevalent in, in, modern, in modern civilizations. Um, in terms of the role of different mutations and breast versus ovary, that's, is, that's kind of a remaining controversy. In the data from the families I've worked with for the last 40 years, I do not see a relationship between particular mutations and breast versus ovary. I just don't see it. Um, my friend and friendly competitor uh, at Utah do see a relationship, and they have a particular region of BRCA2. Well, they essentially divide BRCA2 into two parts, and they, they believe that mutations at essentially early or late are more like, much more likely to be breast and much less likely to be ovary, whereas stop mutations in the middle can be either. I don't see that difference. So, it, it, and it's subtle. So it's, it's not that there's a big difference. Once you move to other genes, it's a much more dramatic effect. For example, mutations in CHECK2 predisposed to breast cancer, essentially very little, if at all, to ovarian cancer. A number of the other genes in the complex, there's a lot of discussion whether they predispose to breast cancer or only ovarian cancer, or only triple negative breast cancer, that is, bre breast cancer that does not involve, that, that has um, no active estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor or perceptin. So it's, the, it, Gene by gene, there is unquestionably a difference. Mutation by mutation, not quite so sure. Yes, the same lady. All right. I, 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 you need to use the mic. So it's just an interesting follow-up. Um, does the process of childbearing reduce yeah. the risk of breast and ovarian cancer in women? Yeah. Yeah. And the and. It is believed that the reason is that the balance of estrogen and progesterone changes after childbearing, changes after the first pregnancy. So that we're, we don't make as much unopposed estrogen after we've had our first completed pregnancy. And it's this unopposed estrogen that is a really rich hormonal environment for the breast ductal epithelium and therefore really buffers the breast ductal cells if they undergo mutation from just entering apoptosis and dying off, which is what we would like a mutant cell to do. So post-childbearing, we have a better balance of estrogen and progesterone, and the cells have a, have a, they still have a rich hormonal milieu, but it's a more balanced one. All the way at the top. Yeah. Thanks for, for a very good talk. So uh, I want to ask that because the DNA repair actually happens everywhere in the body. So you show some data that the uh, you call broker uh, broker genes that have a mutation in uh, breast cancer and ovary cancer and uh, prostate cancer in male. So my question is that um, because these genes are all related to DNA uh, repair. So do you have some data to show that if these genes mutation have some relationship to other cancer types? To other kinds of what? Other cancer types, like oh, the, other uh, cancer types besides breast and ovary? Yeah. Besides breast, yeah. ovary, and prostate? Yes. Right. Um, to a certain degree, yes. So I'll tell you what we know. Um, there is a form of, a rare form of cancer called ocular melanoma. So it's a melanoma of the eye. And mutations in BRCA2 predispose to ocular melanoma. It's still blessedly a very, very low risk, but it's way above background. Pancreatic cancer is also significantly increased among BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation carriers, also blessedly still rare. My own view is that stomach cancer might be also, particularly in um, 
particularly historically, before breast cancer was as common as it is now. And I think that because if you look back in, in, in Mormon pedigrees, of course, Mormon, the Mormon uh, community keeps fabulous records, both hospital records and genealogical records, uh, families that we now know in, in Utah to have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, if you go back in those families, you don't see much breast or ovarian cancer, but you do see a lot of gastric cancer. So I think gastric cancer might be part of the story. There's been a lot of dispute about whether colon cancer is part of the story. I am convinced it is not. That, um, that reports that claim that colon cancer appears disproportionately in families with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations is, in my view, the consequence of much more careful ascertainment of cancers generally in distant relatives in such families compared to families without mutations because they aren't as deeply involved in the process. So I think it's a matter of ascertainment bias. So I would say breast, ovary, prostate are common and obviously important. Um, pancreas, ocular melanoma um, are, are fortunately rare, but, it, but unquestionably significant, and maybe gastric. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, have you considered including the non-coding variants for those gene sets? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm a great fan of non-coding variants in both of these genes. And um, we, we have found, well, I mean, trivially, we have found a large number of non-coding variants that alter splicing, right? either because they're near splice sites or because they're deep in tronic events that set up exonification with in, included stops. We've found a few, five prime UTR or three prime UTR mutations. We have a really nice example of a three prime UTR mutation that alters a microRNA binding site in BRCA1. So yes, um, the whole genome sequencing is entirely a non-coding mutation um, effort aimed at enhancers, of course not yet identified enhancers within the same tabs. Oh, sorry, within the same tabs. Yes, we can take one or two more questions in faculty or maybe high school students. You gotta be brave if you're a high school student to get into this stuff. Dear, dearly, I'm terrified. Crickets. I think we, I think we may have answered all the questions, Karen. Very I think nice. so. And the the English of this crowd is fabulous. Golly, I never. They I are really them. good. They are really good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Professor King and Professor Chen. So this is the end of today's lecture. If any of our guests or students would like to stay behind and take a photo with Professor King, please feel free to do so. Thank you very much for joining us today.